I'm uh, Jeff Sachs, president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I was very fortunate uh, and honored to chair the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. The Lancet Commission issued its report on lessons for the future from the COVID-19 pandemic on September 14th, 2022, uh, at the time of the opening of the UN General Assembly. Following that uh, launch, we have uh, initiated a series of three webinars to discuss key implications of the Commission report for follow-up. And today we have the webinar on global health finance and governance. Uh, we're joined by uh, many, many important leaders in public health and uh, uh, leadership of the World Health Organization, so I'm absolutely grateful. Let me briefly review the main conclusions of the Lancet Commission with regard to today's subject of global health finance and governance. Uh, I think that the report poses a number of challenges for the international system, and uh, that will be the topic of our discussion. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, if you can see that, uh, I will uh, talk uh, about the, <laughs> the main findings and uh, the questions that I think are posed by these findings. Let me start by making an obvious point. Uh, the pandemic uh, has been a horrific experience for the world, and uh, many of the horrors continue until today. The loss of life, the disease burden, the long COVID, the continuing anxieties, the disruptions of global supply chains, the uh, loss of confidence in public institutions, the difficulties of global cooperation, <clears throat> all have been part of this uh, monumentally disruptive experience since the beginning of 2020. We're not out of the woods yet, unfortunately, uh, but we finished our report uh, for the purpose of trying to draw some lessons, even though the pandemic itself isn't over, it was, uh, we thought, possible to draw some lessons that would be helpful, not only to take further steps to bring this pandemic to an end, but also to respond effectively in the upgrading of institutions following this pandemic. Let me uh, remind everybody that best estimates are that if one counts the unreported as well as the reported deaths from COVID, we are around 18 million dead. This is a truly uh, an astounding uh, burden uh, and uh, an astounding calamity. So we're, we're talking about something of uh, profound significance where we need to draw lessons. There's a lot of text on my screen right now, but I'm just going to read basically uh, the first line, which is that countries countries should strengthen national health systems on the foundation of public health and universal health coverage. Our first point is that the response to a pandemic like this requires a health system. Uh, this may seem pretty uh, uh, obvious, but the truth of the matter is that around the world, we found, even in rich countries, parts of the health system, for example, the public health side, not the curative health side, but the public health side, were seriously wanting. A national health system includes both curative health, clinical health, and public health, and countries did not have effective public health systems to respond to this pandemic. The biggest shortfalls, not surprisingly, were in the poorest countries. As part of that strengthening of national health systems, each country should determine and expand national pandemic preparedness plans. So this is a point that's been made by several groups reviewing the pandemic, uh, which is that countries were not ready by and large for 
a new emerging disease, especially one so easily transmissible. And the countries that were the most ready were those in the Asia Pacific that had grappled with the SARS outbreak in 2003, 2004. Those historical memories were also embedded in specific preparedness plans in the readiness of the public to abide by public health mandates and recommendations, for example, on physical distancing or face mask wearing and so forth. And in much of the Asia Pacific, the result was a much lower burden of disease and death from the pandemic, even before the question of vaccines became operational in 2021. The rest of the world was not ready. Uh, this was a pretty steep learning curve in real time, not in a drill, but in a real pandemic for countries around the world on what is pandemic response. And obviously, next time through, we need to be ready uh, in ways that uh, simply were not the case this time. We recommend, importantly, funding as a centerpiece of the global response, funding for the low income countries and the lower middle income countries in particular. And specifically, we call for the creation of a unified global health fund closely aligned with WHO based in Geneva and drawing together a number of existing funds as well as the new pandemic preparedness funding. So there is in Geneva currently, of course, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. There is COVAX, which was the instrument created to uh, do the best possible to get vaccine coverage for COVID to the uh, developing world. There is the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And there is now a new WHO-led financial intermediary fund for pandemic preparedness and response, though based in Washington at the World Bank with the trusteeship of the World Bank. Our recommendation, which is not the, the way things are moving right now, but our recommendation is that these be combined into a global health fund. Uh, and again, really essentially, uh, next door to WHO as our lead international institution for global health, because we face a massive financing challenge for global health and for building health systems and for the health systems for pandemic preparedness that requires in our recommendation, a coherent approach that actually pulls together the strengths of the existing institutions and bolsters them with new financing for primary health system strengthening, which does not have an obvious financing source right now in the international milieu. We say more generally that the UN member states uh, should, it, especially uh, with the responsibility of the G20, should adopt a new financial architecture to scale up uh, the financing for low and middle in, and lower middle income countries to meet the challenges, not only of pandemics, but also climate and the SDGs. And the last two weeks has been uh, a, an ongoing uh, fight, actually, both at COP27, uh, and at uh, the COP, uh, at the uh, G20 in Bali this past week for reforming the global financial architecture so that more funding is available, more fiscal space is available to the poorer countries to take on these big challenges. Let me just uh, conclude uh, in these very brief opening remarks by pointing out that WHO and the World Bank together have produced an excellent report on this question of universal health coverage uh, and all of the work in monitoring uh, UHC, which is target 3.8 of the SDGs, SDG 3 is health for all, 
uh, and uh, target uh, 3.8 is universal health coverage. And that, according to our panel's recommendations, our commission's recommendations, is central for effective response. Well, what we know from the monitoring is UHC, universal health coverage, does not yet exist. And not surprisingly, it falls, sh uh, the shortfall is most dire in the poorest parts of the world and notably in tropical Africa, as you can see on the map. Uh, when we look at the correlation between the universal health coverage index score prepared by WHO and the World Bank and compare it with the income levels of countries, it's almost a perfect relationship. Poor countries have low health coverage. Rich countries have much higher health coverage. We have a problem of poverty here. We have a problem that poor countries cannot afford SDG3 unless there is additional financing available. There is some good news, which is from 2000 to 2019, there was improvement in this index of health coverage, more access. Uh, I've been lucky to be part of this and witnessing this since 2000 when I chaired a commission for WHO on macroeconomics and health, financing did rise. What we learned about the increased financing, for example, the financing going through the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria or the US programs PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative is that money works. If you put in more financing, you get better health outcomes. You get more health coverage. In other words, there's nothing that prevents us moving the resources to achieve UHC. But poverty remains the biggest killer in effect, whether it's in inability to respond to a pandemic or more generally the uh, toll of poverty on life conditions and the shortfalls of the health system itself. The gap in life expectancy is shown here in this map between the longest lived countries, uh, Japan, for example, with a life expectancy of 85, and the, the lowest life expectancy countries in Africa is 30 years difference between the mid 50s and the mid 80s in life expectancy on, on one planet that we aim to be a civilized place. And this tracks also health expenditures, which vary also by two orders of magnitude. Uh, it may be 50 to $100 per capita in the poor countries per year versus 5,000 to 10,000 per person per year in the rich countries. And this showed up, of course, we know in the challenge to get vaccine coverage Every map looks the same, basically. Poor countries lag way behind rich countries in every dimension, whether it was the health coverage, whether it is life expectancy, whether it is vaccine coverage. This is a matter of basic economics. And this excellent report by WHO and the World Bank demonstrates this, that low-income countries lack coverage because uh, income because low income blocks the access. The core of WHO's recommendations for decades, the correct uh, core, is the need for a primary health care system. And what uh, WHO calls its uh, primary health care theory of change, which is outlined in this report. And we endorse this in the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. Now, the final point I want to make before turning it to our esteemed speakers is that we have in 2023 upcoming a global summit on universal health coverage in September 2023 at the uh, UN uh, General Assembly. I would like to see a global health fund uh, announced uh, at the time uh, next year. We need a fundamental breakthrough of funding. Let me note that in the adoption this past week at the G20 of the Financial Intermediary Fund for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which is a first 
instance of financial response to this, this is, as often the case with our donor countries, very, very narrowly conceived. And I believe from the press releases that the commitment so far for this uh, preparedness fund remains under $2 billion total. I, I may be out of date, but what we need clearly is tens of billions of dollars per year. This is a, a complete difference of perception of the donor countries, which want a kind of narrowly focused uh, marginal uh, financing of specific pandemic preparedness versus the Lancet Commission, which wants health systems to function according to the vision of WHO. And for that, I can say as an economist, uh, we need a different order of magnitude of financing to make that work. And we want to support WHO and the global health community in trying to make clear what is the real financing needed in order to uh, learn properly from this uh, pandemic uh, disaster that we have been through. So those are the uh, main points from the commission side. I'm going to pass the microphone uh, to Julie Bartels uh, at uh, SDSN and the Secretariat of the Commission, and she will uh, take us through the program now. So thank you very, very much. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Ryan, who is the Executive Director of the WHO Health Emergencies Program. Um, Dr. Ryan, please uh, give us your remarks. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you hear me? You yes. Can? Okay, good. Great. Uh, I you, you're a hard act to follow, Jeff. Uh, so <laughs> I will try not to, to, to do much too, too, too much repetition. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Commission. Uh, WHO, you know, obviously believes that the, the core recommendations of the Commission are really hitting the right areas, hitting the right spot in terms of governance, the financing, the systems, the tools, the workforce that we need. Uh, you mentioned this uh, in terms of uh, clinical care um, and safe, scalable clinical care is still an essential part of the health system, but it's an essential part of pandemic or emergency response as well. But community protection is what takes the pressure off the health system and being able to do the same at community level uh, is something that's been terribly underinvested in. And you, you mentioned that the last mile of health delivery primary health care is the first mile of health security. Uh, but they're not essentially, they're not the same thing. And I think we sometimes get these conflated. It's interesting in the SDGs, when we set targets for UHC and for health delivery, we didn't set targets for epidemics and pandemics. It's, it's target 3.D. It didn't even, it didn't even uh, justify a specific target. And again, that shows the, the schism in people's minds that focuses on health delivery. That's great. Uh, again, I will contend that health systems delivery, purely delivered as that, will not stop a pandemic or an epidemic. What you need is to, to deliver both. You need to be able to deliver essential health care and essential public health functions at the same time through a primary health care led system, where both parts of that system are fully integrated, interoperable, able to manage and cope different ways with different stresses at different times. Uh, and that's a very sophisticated approach. Uh, but it's not, it, it, the system won't work. It's not a yin or yang, Jeff. It's not going to work to say, we'll all just run down this road and then, then we'll all run down the next road after it. And we tend to pendulum swing on these things. Uh, so we swing away from investing in health systems to invest in public health functions. And then we swing back uh, the next time we see the TB data or we see the HIV data. So I think there's a need to focus and a collective integrated approach for strengthening national health systems. And I think the commission has really nailed it uh, very close to, to what, how WHO would see the world. Um, the, you know, in our world, the, the we mentioned the, the, the safe, scalable care, uh, the community uh, protection, uh, collaborative surveillance, um, access to countermeasures and coordination. They're the five essential functions in terms of health emergency preparedness and response. They don't work. Those functions don't work unless you have a skilled, 
protected paid workforce. They don't work unless you have core financing to the health system and to the public health system. And they don't work unless that's governed at all levels. And I mean governed by communities in communities, governed nationally uh, and governed regionally and globally. So the recommendations being made by the commission in just purely avoiding a systems approach and focusing in on the financial solutions that are needed and the governance solutions. Governance and financing solutions don't guarantee success. I know you did say there that money, uh, money talks, money makes a difference. It does. Financing put into an effective system that is efficient and able to deliver works. Throwing money at a poorly designed system, at a poorly governed system, drives corruption, it drives inefficiency, it drives frustration, and it drives non-delivery. The real trick uh, is, and I see Juan Pato is getting ready to speak as well, is how do we align the... The, the design of a system at all levels, how do we align that with the financing needed to drive it and how is that governed? And I mean governed as in who is accountable? Because governance is often seen as a kind of a, dis, you know, it's a distant concept. We set up committees to oversee the overseen and then every, someone oversees them. But governance is actually around accountability. Governance means we take responsibility. The people, the, the, the government of a country has a sovereign responsibility to protect the lives and health of its citizens. That's governance. You're in government in order to meet that accountability. You're elected to do that and be, be the same at regional or at global level. So I, 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 I hope we don't just say governance for the sake of setting up new mechanisms. Governance means absorbing accountability at whatever level you govern, whether you're a member of a community health committee all the way to sitting on a, a global health board or an executive board of the World Health Organization. Um, so within all of that, the proposals around funding, I think you're right. I think FIF is a step forward. No one set a ceiling on FIF. FIF is at the two billion because that's what the donors have put in. Uh, it's very clear in the documents underpinning that from the G20, the Finance and Health Minister's Working Group, and Juan Paulo will probably speak more to that. It's very clear. It's exactly what you said. The gap is seen as ten bit north of ten billion a year. That's the gap that's seen, uh, and therefore the the current fifth does not meet that. Equally, a preparedness fund needs to be much bigger. Whether member states and those who govern us decide to integrate those into larger instruments, that 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 that's a governance decision. That's a decision that's way beyond my pay grade. But I want to see at the very minimum is coordination of multilateral funding mechanisms so that they're able to do what they say on the tin. How far you go from coordination to integration depends what the appetite for that is. And that's a political decision as much as it is a practical decision. Um, the, uh, but there are other funding um, um, things needed. I mean, FIF is set up to really work, focus on preparedness, but it doesn't address at-risk funding for access to countermeasures. If someone, and you may not need an actual fund for that. You may need some kind of a commitment fund. It doesn't have to have money in it, but when somebody presses the red button in five years time, is there 30 billion available imme immediately? So it might be a commitment to fund, not actual money. Similarly, the commitment to scale up response in countries at the beginning of a pandemic doesn't necessarily need to be money, but it could be commitment uh, to deliver that money. Uh, and that's, that's sometimes much criticized mechanism, the PEF mechanism, the World Bank, I think had a lot of merit in actually deciding on having upfront money available through an insurance and a, and a cash mechanism. It may not have been the perfect mechanism or the perfect vehicle, but the idea that there would be funding, triggerable funding, not necessarily sitting in an account, but triggerable funding to get to scale, both in upstream development of countermeasures and downstream delivery of response. That's where we struggle most. In fact, we actually access money for upstream. The hardest funding to access during this pandemic was funding to support downstream countermeasures, oxygen delivery, expansion of workforce, uh, delivery of goods and services. Uh, that's where we struggle. That's where we really struggled. And then there are obviously other mechanisms. We have our own contingency fund in WHO. Uh, it's $100 million. It's smaller scale funding. It allows us to respond in minutes and hours. So linking different, whether we need one global health fund, Jeffrey, or whether we need a, a series of financial instruments that are that are managed as a, as, a, as, a, as a set of tools, it really is, I'll leave that to Juan Pablo and people much more smarter than me and Jeffrey, you and others, 
to decide. Uh, sometimes putting everything into one basket creates conformity, but it also can create calcification and, and inefficiency. Uh, efficient, agile mechanisms, well coordinated, can also work equally as well. So I, I won't speak to, you know, again, these are political and, and, and financial decisions. I'm not a financial expert, but the idea of aligned, coordinated health funding, uh, especially uh, when we talk about um, moving through, I don't know, uh, well, Pablo World Bank have just launched uh, IDA20. There's a lot of funding out there too in the multilateral development system. There's a lot of funding out there in the international financing institutions. Part of the problem in the past has been multiple institutions investing in national preparedness through their own plans. Everyone going, uh, I remember at one point years ago, the Minister of Health in, in, in Nigeria said to me that he had 80 different health representations in Abuja, you know? So, so who, who's, who's disintegrating the system? It's, it's the outsiders who are. We need one national action plan for public health security integrated into a national health systems plan. That plan needs many supporters and many donors. What we don't need is hundreds of plans funded vertically by different institutions who all think they know better. This is creating tremendous fracturing of effort. It's confusing our member states. It's driving corruption, quite frankly, and we need to bring that back together. So the idea of strong national action plans uh, where governments own that, you see the UHPR process now, the Universal Health Preparedness Review process, allowing governments to, to come to a much more accountable vision for what they want to commit to. There are many instruments to measure and deliver on those national action plans. What we lack is a, a clear financing mechanism to fund those plans and hold everyone accountable for that delivery. Uh, and beyond that, finally, in, in terms of government's governance, <clears throat> we are making progress with the intergovernmental negotiating body at a treaty, we believe uh, a, a global accord could underpin much of the governance and financing and systems and tools approaches over the next over the coming years. Uh, we very much appreciate and and warmly welcome the work we've had with the World Bank on this. Uh, I think WHO and the World Bank have taken a tremendous step forward, not only in in bringing this fund together with the G20 but actually in bringing our organizations together in a much more functional way. And we need to do that. I think financing institutions and health institutions need to come together in a much more systematic way in order to deliver on exactly uh, what you said. Uh, there, there's lots more I could speak to. We're currently in the process of reviewing the international health regulations with the working group of member states, uh, obviously the, the member states working on the international negotiating body. So we're really in a phase now where the member states of the organization are in deep, deep consultation about the future rules of the game. Similarly, I think on the World Bank side, deep consultation through the G20 finance and health ministers on exactly what you said, Jeffrey. What are the rules of the game going to be for financing health writ large in future? And how are we going to drive those investments? Not as a cost in the system, but as an investment in the future as a protection of our civilization and our economy and our way of life, not as an insidious cost in the system that is seen as that. It's seen as a liability. Health is seen as a libelous cost in the delivery of governance. We need to change that. We need to change that narrative uh, and show that health protection is an investment uh, and you can measure the benefit of that. You counted the bodies earlier, which is tragic. Uh, we need to be able to demonstrate that doing things a different way results in a different outcome. Thank you. Well, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, really uh, wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I think just a couple points I know, then we'll turn to uh, Juan Pablo, uh, and who will give us some very important perspective. But I think it's clear that there are two kinds of funding that we're talking about, and we should be clear about that. One is ongoing funding for health systems uh, year in, year out. Uh, and there, a, a, there are problems everywhere, but a fundamental problem is just poverty. We have, to, we have to face up to the fact that there is a significant part of the world in which government budgets cannot cover what should be regarded and what is regarded as a basic human right. Uh, and that is uh, access to a functioning health system. And that's uh, almost an iron law of poverty. And we've never really uh, faced up to that, uh, but we have uh, in bits and pieces like the specialized funds. 
Then there is the question of the emergency response when disasters occur, like uh, the outbreak of this pandemic, and there will be others in the future. And there, your point that it's not even necessarily money in the bank that counts. Uh, it is the ability to have a wholly elastic supply of financing to face the emergency. What's interesting there, I think uh, clearly, is that uh, when the pandemic hit, the rich countries for their own response had a very elastic response of trillions and trillions of dollars. The United States incrementally spent five or six trillion dollars more than had been envisaged in the budget in the first two years of the pandemic. But when it came to financing COVAX, the facility for vaccine coverage, it was going uh, cup in hand, desperately trying to find a few billion dollars here and there, and it turned out to be impossible to do. By the time the money was actually raised, the uh, pharmaceutical companies had made their contracts with those who could pay uh, up front. Uh, and um, we know how difficult it was, therefore, to operationalize universal vaccine coverage, much less other downstream countermeasures as you described them. We just didn't have the contingency financing in, in place. So uh, I think these two have to work hand in hand. Uh, I want to be absolutely uh, clear as well that um, I always regard money as allowing you to build the pipes to have the governance. Uh, so I don't see it as a contradiction or an either or, and it's not throwing money at problems, it's building uh, the solutions in, in my view, but absolutely we need functionality to be able to deliver. Just so people know what fifths are, uh, because that's not everybody's vocabulary normally. They are financial intermediary funds. They're kind of trustee funds that the World Bank manages for special purposes. And this fifth is a fifth for uh, pandemic uh, preparedness uh, and response. So it's a particular financial intermediary fund. And uh, I think if I might, uh, um, Julie, uh, probably on the program, we were going to turn next to Juan Pablo, who is uh, of uh, lead responsibility at the World Bank and partner with WHO on this. So we're very eager to hear the perspective from our lead uh, development finance institution uh, on how you see this question of uh, the scaling up of financing. So Juan Pablo, over to you. Jeffrey, thanks so much. And to you, to you, Julie, and everybody in the team. Um, and, and congratulations for, for leading the, the Lancet Commission in the report, excellent recommendations. I'm very happy also to talk after Mike, uh, makes my life easier. He has an incredible capacity to explain the correct things in the correct way. And by the way, um, Mike, 100% uh, in agreement. Uh, it's also very important for us to see that we do have uh, that alignment um, with all the very important messages that you just shared with us. I, I want to comment briefly and thinking about our time for the discussion on three of the recommendations that the Lancet Commission report brings forward that are close to the World Bank's work. There are many, by the way, correctly focused on strengthening WHO. And I want just to highlight that those recommendations are also on the table and are extremely important for the global health agenda. Uh, but that said, um, I want to, to stop briefly of course, on, on this fifth, now called the, the Pandemic Fund, I will also stop a little bit on the National Pandemic Preparedness Plans. And for last, I want to talk briefly about the health system strengthening um, recommendation, Jeffrey, that you started with. So quickly on, 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 on the first recommendation, I, I know that the idea of a global health fund that you just, by the way, illustrated is much wider and stronger than uh, an intermediary fund in the bank. But I do want to uh, say that 12 months ago, we didn't have this additional instrument for pandemic preparedness, prevention and response. Now we have it. 12 months ago, many people were skeptical that we would be able to develop this instrument. Now we have it. Um, as you said, 
It has so far mobilized, Jeffrey, $1.5 billion, uh, but it's confronted with immense, tremendous needs um, and expectations that are many times bigger than those resources so far. But the good thing is that, again, it exists. It has bring together many, many different institutions, government, civil society, um, and it has an open horizon in front of it to strengthen its governance with inclusivity, to decide on key next steps, and hopefully to bring additionality in a sustained way to a much underinvested area as is pandemic preparedness prevention in our countries. And I'm speaking of all countries, but in particular middle and low income countries, where this area within health systems has been further underinvested than um, any of the other areas. So I think this is um, an important development. And again, it's one that needs to be crafted as we work together. Um, we've been able to do this working hand in hand with WHO. I want to praise uh, here Mike and WHO and Scott Pendergast and um, DG Tedros for all their work. By the way, uh, Mike is gonna be leading the technical advisory panel and um, all these important technical aspects of pandemic preparedness and prevention will be brought into the advisory capacity of that panel in guiding the proper investments from the pandemic fund. And I think that's gonna be extremely important. There are other um, important decisions in the coming weeks or months. Um, the most important one for me is the results framework that will be guiding the medium and longer term of the pandemic fund. It's going to be very important that there's convergence around that results framework and what it is expected for this additional instrument. Um, but also in the coming weeks, we will know more about the first call for proposals, how it's going to be focused, uh, how it's going to be reaching countries that really need additionality in their efforts to mobilize resources around pandemic preparedness and response. And most of what we're listening, I don't want to anticipate a decision from the board of the fund, is that it's going to be focused on integrated disease surveillance, which has a lot of those core functions that Mike referred to which are deeply needed, again, within our health systems as core public health functions uh, connected to better response to future challenges like we just uh, had with uh, COVID-19. Uh, maybe let me stop very quickly in two comments on the, on the fund, which I think are gonna be very important for that discussion. One, and it's, it's that it's not exclusively for what we call IDA countries or low-income countries. It is also, a fund that will be looking at IBRD countries, middle-income countries. And this is very important. Listening from friends who know a lot about pandemics themselves, uh, we know that probably the next pandemic may happen in, an, in a middle-income country, in big cities um, where a lot of the public health functions are basically still extremely weak. So it's not just focusing on low-income countries, but also bringing in the middle-income countries in terms of preventing future pandemics. And the second comment has to do with regional initiatives, Jeffrey. One of the things that we learned from COVID in a very harsh way, I would say, is that countries also need to break down uh, political frontiers and work together regionally when it comes to pandemics. I could talk about my region, Latin America, but we saw a great example in Africa coming together around a regional CDC, coming together around uh, mechanisms for procure procurement of vaccines, uh, building on a network of, of, of surveillance, and even coming together in, West, in, in East Africa in a, a national regional uh, network of public labs. Those are all excellent examples. And I think other regional um, initiatives are taking care are taking place right now, and this pandemic fund and other resources should work with them, making again regional uh, capacity an important element of future pandemic preparedness. Quickly, let me move now, leaving the pandemic fund aside, and I'm sure there may be questions and discussions around it. 
Uh, let me move into the national pandemic preparedness plans that the commission also highlighted as much needed. Um, I was thinking at, as, as, on, on my own experience in a middle income country like Colombia, Jeffrey, and, and by the way, I saw my predecessor Alejandro in the commission's team. Uh, he's now with another responsibility facing a different public challenge, also very important. But of course we have national pandemic preparedness plans, but we need to further strengthen them. And we need to really invest in the capacities behind those plans. So this is a much welcome recommendation. The bank working closely with WHO in many of these countries is helping prepare these national preparedness plans. We have roughly 20 of them done in complete detail led by countries. And of course, it's just the baseline. We need to continue on that. And my hope is that to a great extent, the proposals funded for the pandemic fund will build a national pandemic preparedness plans at the country level. That's what's logical. And that would make things much better effective and organized in terms of the needed investments. We're also using there for those pandemic uh, preparedness plans, other resources that the bank has, like the HEPR Trust Fund, or like the IDA 20 resources that Mike referred to, which have explicit commitments in this round of resources on pandemic preparedness and prevention. So it's important that IDA is explicitly focusing on the homework that needs to be done at the country level in terms of preparedness and prevention. Um, there are also ongoing discussions, and maybe Professor Matsukato will, will mention this, on, on the relation that, that the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, has with uh, these important areas of global public goods, and uh, in particular, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, and how it may look into the existence of these, let's say, assessments and preparedness plans uh, for their own uh, uh, relations with the countries in terms of the macro and fiscal uh, way forward. I'm not an expert on that, but it's important to basically acknowledge that these discussions are happening, and I do believe they are also going in the correct way. And let me conclude now by moving to the third recommendation, and again, for me, the most interesting one, which is um, strengthening health systems. The bank currently has in health, um, to a great extent, uh, increased by the COVID response, uh, but also being sustained by very strong demand from the countries, a portfolio of $34 billion in health system strengthening projects. Most of these projects, almost all of them, are focused on primary health care and universal health coverage. They're country-owned, they're country-led. Um, they try to integrate the responses around the country leadership. Um, we try to follow Mike's advice of not being one more divisive voice. We try to align platforms and instruments behind the country leadership with all what that implies in terms of opportunities and difficulties, et cetera. But we do believe that this has to be bottom up, country driven, and that's the only way health systems are really constructed to face their communities. It has a lot of public health functions embedded in it. These functions, as Mike said, are different from many of the essential services delivery functions, but they're closely and intimately intertwined. It's very difficult to disentangle them at the end of the day. It's the same nurse, it's the same general physician. By the way, it's the same community and many times the same systems and facilities, et cetera, that are doing both public health functions and essential services delivered to mothers and infants, just to give an example. So we need to be conscious of assessing that the, that the, the functionality is precise, but also that the overall system is strengthened. Uh, we have two concerns here. Um, I would say three concerns that I want to highlight for the discussion. One. You mentioned the universal health coverage report. We're working together with WHO and the 2023, Jeffrey. And what we could anticipate is an important backstep in terms of progress to universal health coverage. Second concern has to do with the health workforce. As Mike properly said, without people properly trained and also properly sustained, we won't have health systems delivering public health or essential services. 
and in particular, community health workforces. So we're looking very carefully into that aspect. And the third one has to do with the sustainability of recurring costs. Uh, it's our estimate that at least 75 or 80 percent of the costs associated with pandemic preparedness, prevention, and response are recurring costs. Systems need to have them in place year after year after year in their budget and in their institutions. So this is very difficult in the current and, pro and projected uh, fiscal scenario. Let me conclude by acknowledging that pandemic preparedness and prevention are unfortunately long-term endeavors. Nobody will be able to buy out of the shelf a short-term solution for our countries. They are part of health systems which are created through decades of continuous and sustained investment. And that's what we need to do. Of course, we need to start now, hopefully yesterday, but we need to maintain the effort, Jeffrey, in the long term. And for that, political decision and leadership is a must. For that, confronting the determinants of health, and in particular, poverty, inequity, and discrimination is also a must. And just to conclude, also Mike said it, we will need a lot of institutional capacity with sound governance to again sustain a long-term effort that will have the world better prepared for future health challenges. Juan Pablo, thank you very much. Uh, and really excellent, uh, excellent report and very encouraging. Let me make a couple of points if I could, uh, things that I've been worrying about for 25 years uh, on this. First, I think this strong link of uh, WHO and the World Bank is is really superb um, because WHO is a normative institution and it doesn't have the bucks there. Uh, and uh, the World Bank is our financing institution. One thing that would be tremendously helpful, and I know it's part of the planning, but I think it really needs strengthening, is to bring WHO together with uh, the World Bank and the regional development banks in a coherent operational way, because a lot of the financing will come through regional development banks in, in your region, the Inter-American Development Bank, or in uh, Africa, the African Development Bank, and so forth. And I think a teamwork that links the normative institution with the development banks generally is, is the right strategy. It could even supplant a global health fund. It could essentially be the governance of a global health fund. So, uh, but we, we need that team very clearly in place. But then something that I think is really fundamental, and it, it has been a fundamental mindset barrier that is crippling, is this question of recurrent costs. We need development finance to cover recurrent costs. There was long for 50 years a mantra that development finance could cover capital costs, but not recurrent costs. This is completely mistaken, fundamentally wrong. And the reason is very simple. Think of a, even not the poorest country, but a poor country World Bank member that has a per capita GDP of $1,000, which is typical in Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look, that country probably raises between 15 and 20% of GDP in government revenues. And maybe it's able to manage 4% of GDP in uh, health outlays. But 4% of GDP for $1,000 per capita means $40 per person for health. And so even without any more research, we know, well, that's not a health system. You cannot run a health system at $40 per person. In the United States, it's 10,000. We're not gonna get there, but we're not gonna do it at 40, no matter how efficient. A health system needs a few hundred dollars per capita. It cannot be found in the national budget, period. 
So the question is, where is it going to be found? And and what is most of that is salaries. Most of that is recurrent costs. Most of that is the health workforce. It's got to come from outside for the next 20 years. 20 years on, these countries will be much richer. They will be developed. And then they'll be able to fund this. But if we want to have functioning health systems for two or three billion people living in countries that are too poor to do it themselves, we must from the outside help to finance recurrent costs, period. It's simple arithmetic. It runs against all the mantras of development that I've been experiencing in 40 years of work in this area because people need to do arithmetic, which they don't do, uh, our governments, uh, your, your member governing uh, institutions. If in your 2023 universal health coverage report, you can lay out the basic arithmetic, how much does a health system cost, even a rudimentary one? What can a national budget finance? What is a fundamental gap? How can that fundamental gap be covered this will, I will be very happy to help on that. This will be a huge advance of understanding. Now, one more point that is counterintuitive. Even if you're covering uh, recurrent costs from outside, it can be by debt, by the way. It doesn't have to be grants, as long as the terms of the debt are reasonable. Uh, if they're IDA terms, 40 years at Concessional interest rates, great. Even if they're IBRD terms, non so-called non-concessional, they're certainly concessional relative to what the country can do by itself. And you could borrow for 30 or 40 years at 4% interest to fund the health system. And 30 or 40 years from now, a country at $1,000 per capita might be at $6,000 per capita, $8,000 per capita. It could service the debts and have had a health system during those 30 years onward. So we have to help the US Congress, the US Treasury, others to understand that recurrent cost does not mean national budgets and because it's impossible, absolutely impossible. It has to come from development finance, doesn't have to be grants, it could be loans, but it can't be five-year euro bond loans at 12% interest. It has to be development finance institution loans, basically on IBRD or IDA terms. So just my little pitch, which I've been giving for 30 years, uh, but it's arithmetic that we need financing for recurrent costs, for salaries, for people. <laughs> reliable and it's no sense in telling the governments be serious raise your spending they can't do it on their own until they get richer so this i think is just a basic point and if you bring the rest of the development banks along you'll have more money in the kitty for this and the last point i want to mention is my work at the un in the coming year is to help raise more money for you, for the World Bank, for the regional development banks, because my argument is we need five to 10 times more development finance than we have right now. We run at maybe 120 to 150 billion a year development finance, but it should be 500 billion or even a trillion a year. And that's my job is to help you get more money and your job is to help explain why that money will really develop what we need to develop. So I just want to concur 100%, but I want us to get past this mantra of recurrent costs. They are recurrent, but for poverty-stricken countries, they need help to meet them. That's, that's the basic arithmetic that we need to emphasize. Thank you very much, Jeff. Julie, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and thank you to Dr. Ribe for your ex um, excellent comments, especially about health system strengthening. Um, so next, I want to introduce uh, Ms. Joy Fumafi, from the, who's the new co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. Um, and she was also the um, principal local government auditor for the people of Botswana and served in the parliament of Botswana. So um, thank you. Um, Ms. Pumafi is joining by phone.
Well, basically, I was agreeing with all the comments that were being made, but uh, making the important point that um, in addition to what you are saying about um, just um, the basics, primary health care uh, services being financed is a big challenge because you cannot finance primary health care systems at uh, 40 US dollars per person. I think what is equally important is that um, when we talk about the systems that need to be financed and that need to be structured, coordinated, um, and, and for which we need to hold uh, our governments and other stakeholders, of course, private sector, civil society, uh, and communities accountable, it goes beyond health systems. You know, there's the One Health Interface. There's the health systems, there's the research and development, innovation, development and access to medical uh, countermeasures. That needs to be covered as that's part of the system that needs to be financed. Socioeconomic preparedness, that is social protection, education, you know, mental health and psychosocial health that has become so evident now with COVID-19. This needs to be effectively financed as well. The multi-sectoral preparedness in terms of the trade systems, you know, travel, transportation, supply chains, which, which really hampered our response during this pandemic. We need to look at the human development aspects of it, including the health workforce uh, 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 training and the other related sectors. So it's a huge systems area. So the, the what we feel at the at Global Preparedness Monitoring Board is that in order to have this whole system a, a approach, you really do need to have a coordinating mechanism that will link all the global a, a players, link all the national and regional players together so that uh, we can actually um, we, we can actually be prepared to respond to the next next pandemic. So the governance component is extremely important. It's not just about financing, but it's about what is it that we are financing. We are currently preparing a global preparedness uh, um, um, monitoring framework, which are around these you know, type of dimensions, which we will use to monitor the state of the world's preparedness. And we will be relying, of course, on cu the current work that is being done um, on, on, um, on a results framework. Uh, we will be relying on you know, the type of uh, guidance that you that this commission that your commission has just uh, has just uh, uh, produced um, but i think what is really more important is that um, what is it that we are going to be financing which is really the, me the message that i want to put forward yes the financing is not enough we need to we need to address the current financing as well as the long-term financing in a more sustainable manner and in a more deliberately structured manner. But what will we be financing? How are we going to ensure that we have mechanisms in place that will that that will uh, channel the resources to where they are needed and which will prioritize the right areas? And for me, that is equally as equally important as the actual design of the um, of the financing uh, mechanism. So you know our message uh, from GPMB is that um, let us create a more coherent global multisexual response with proper coordination, um, led of course by WHO and and the World Bank and the other UN processes, um, but incorporating uh, the, the the private sector, the the all the global players and regional and national players in global health, because if we don't do it that way, if we don't adopt a more structured approach, um, uh, the, the, we are going to continue to have the huge gaps in investment in important areas of preparedness and overall incoherent approach uh, that has actually um, uh, led us to where we are now, where, where we have a, a total um, disarray in terms of our emergency ecosystem. Um, so we we are hoping that people can 
can appreciate that financing on its own is not a standalone, that systems is not a standalone, that a, a multi-sectoral universal response is required is so that in mechanisms for coordination, action across sectors, across governments is actually necessary in order for, to get us to where we need to be. So that really is our um, concern at the moment. And, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm encouraged that this report is taking us in the right direction, but I think I want us to appreciate that um, we have to, to think a little bit broader than this, and we have to bring in more stakeholders. And we, unfortunately, we do have to be as ambitious as we possibly can in order to be able to, to sufficiently respond uh, to the next uh, 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 pandemic, but also to recover effectively from this one. And uh, in order for us to adequately strengthen accountability for preparedness. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Joy, thank you very much. And very uh, with, the, with a very clear message about what is the content of preparedness uh, and again, I would also emphasize, uh, I think, completely consistently with you that uh, it's not preparedness only for a new emerging disease. It's our current context where uh, many countries uh, have ongoing multiple uh, epidemic diseases and other causes of uh, premature mortality that lead to that outcome of life expectancy dozens of years less than uh, than than they should be uh, basically and if i might just uh, i wanted to share one one thought again i know i'm a broken record on this but i think it's important if countries actually if national governments actually feel that there will be financing available for well thought out plans they will think out plans in much more detail uh, than if they don't feel that there's actual financing. We're a little bit in that uh, situation again with the climate change. Countries are told, make bold plans, and then they say, okay, but where's the money? Uh, so they're, they're making plans, but they're not getting the financing. My microcosm of this, and Joy, you were, of course, one of the world leaders in this, when funding actually started for AIDS treatment, for example, in the early 2000s, suddenly plans came that were nowhere to be found beforehand because governments knew if we get our act together, the Global Fund or PEPFAR or others will actually fund us. So it's really worth pursuing it. Presidents leaned on their health ministers. Why don't we have the money? Our neighbor has the money. Why don't we have the money? Well, we need to put in a plan. We'll put in a plan. Uh, and so I think if we combine the idea of uh, this comprehensive, effective systems approach with actual financing potentially available for good plans, we really can leverage a big response. And there I would again emphasize Mike and uh, Juan Pablo and other uh, of the development finance institutions, if the package can be really there. One other instrument that was very useful in the global fund that I, I, I was surprised at how well it worked was the country coordination mechanism. Basically, if you want funding, you have to get the main stakeholders within the country together, just as you were saying, Joy. Uh, don't come with the Ministry of Health plan by itself. Come with a Ministry of Health plan that has incorporated the key stakeholders and our technical review board, which Mike is going to lead in this case uh, for uh, the fifth, um, will respond to such a uh, a program. But if you come only Ministry of Health alone, you're not coming in a in a credible way. It comes back to my mind, have the clear incentive, do your homework, you will actually get funded at an adequate scale to do it. We don't have the money in the bank to be able to make that promise now, but if we combine not only the specific 
uh, new fund, but the, uh, the, the backing of the development finance institutions more generally, and we build up their portfolios so that they can be lending a lot more money on favorable terms, then I think it's possible to have that joint vision that you, Joy, Mike, uh, and Juan Pablo have all expressed credibly put forward to governments, do your homework, you will be supported. And that will generate a lot of homework, a, a lot of good planning, uh, and, and therefore a lot of systems building that we know can, can take place. So um, that, that would be my, my reaction to your very wise comments. Um, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. I, I could not agree more um, because I think, you know, our our vulnerability as countries at the moment is that we rely on donations and development assistance. And this development assistance is very limited and it provides only a fraction of what is needed. So you are absolutely right that um, we need a system that is more reliable, more robust, that we can have more confidence in. And that, that at the same time uh, builds our own capacities to, to, to finance uh, ourselves more reliably long term. So, um, I mean, I, I'm just agreeing with what you are saying. I mean, you have actually hit the nail uh, on the head. Wonderful. I think those of us that are trying to make our systems work can begin to see <laughs> that they're, you know, we are together, these systems that, that need to be uh, functioning and scaled up. And I think that the lessons of the pandemic give us this opportunity to really press home this case very strongly. Uh, and uh, as we go into 2023, perhaps we'll have that breakthrough moment that where we can get the political leadership on board to to take that systems approach so that it's not cup in hand every time but actually a full-fledged system uh, that is that is working uh, in place and uh, Julie back to you uh, thank you so much so next we'll have um, professor Mariana Mazzucato she's joining um, by a video video recording she couldn't be with us today um, but I'm going to share her recording. Hello, um, I am Mariana Mazzucato. I am a professor at University College London, where I direct the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And I'm really speaking to you today as the chair of the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All. And it's really this combination, actually, of these two words I've just mentioned, public purpose and health for all. What does that look like? So first of all, of course, we know that just like with climate change, the cost of inaction in terms of not investing in global health systems is so much greater than the cost of action. By not investing in global health systems, for example, the economic cost of the COVID-19 pandemic was so much greater than it had to be. And there's different studies that have you know, shown why we should be investing in health and seeing it as an investment and not a cost, why it's positive for our economy. Of course, it also enables all the people in our economies to uh, <laughs> to be nourished, to be nurtured, and also eventually also to work better in terms of actually adding to economic growth. But that's not enough. We must also remember the other side, and this is really the side that the council focuses on, which is that health for all matters. It matters for human rights reasons. It matters for reasons related to our sustainable development goals. So what we try to do in the council is we start with the idea of health for all being the goal, and then we backtrack and ask, what does it mean for how we design the economy to deliver on that? And the more we can do that also by innovating and investing, yes, it would also lead to economic growth. But really asking what does health for all mean, whether it's for vaccines, so actually vaccinating the entire world, um, and then backtracking and asking what it means for the design of all the different areas, whether it's intellectual property rights, whether it's the collaborations between public and private actors, whether it's how we do budgeting, so outcomes-oriented budgeting. And the council, which is 
uh, made of uh, all women economists from around the globe, from the five continents, has been looking at this over the last two years. And our work streams have been divided into four. Uh, the first on value, how do we actually value health for all? Uh, the second on how do we innovate? How do we invest and innovate for health for all with common good metrics uh, at the design of the collaboration? The third on financing, finance isn't neutral, right? So how do we actually finance health for all with issues around access, universe, uh, universality, and really paying attention to the quality of the finance, not just the quantity of the finance. And lastly, public sector capacity. Without capacity on the ground, we actually won't end up with the ability of countries globally actually to invest and be able to innovate in their local health systems, which again, we found was absolutely crucial during this last pandemic. So maybe I'll just say something quickly about those four streams, which I think are very important for your conference today. Uh, first on value, you know, my own work for a long time has been trying to unpick this very siloed way that we think about value in economics as though it's just created in the private sector and somehow the public sector is there just to fix market failures or to regulate or to redistribute that value. What we actually know about value in the economy is it's collectively created. Of course, we need private companies. So in the healthcare uh, area, of course, we have you know small biotech companies, large pharmaceutical companies, and so on. But there's also been, it continues to be, and will always be, a very important role for the public sector, not only in terms of creating healthcare systems, but also investing in the uh, drugs and the therapeutics and the remedies themselves. And this really requires then to really focus on what does it mean to collectively create value? What does it mean to share the rewards of that value creation? But also in terms of investing within healthcare systems, really seeing the people who work within our healthcare uh, uh, infrastructure, both the soft and the hard infrastructure, as value creators. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on this. We've looked at what it means for how we value care. Um, and often it is women who are in those um, uh, uh, areas of, um, of the economy. Uh, we have undervalued care workers. We called the essential workers important during COVID. We even clapped them, but we haven't actually been resourcing uh, those infrastructures and also their, their pay. They're often underpaid. And again, coming back to the role of public investment, you know, in places like even the United States where you have over 40 billion a year, of healthcare, sorry, health investment spending by the National Institutes of Health, we haven't included that investment in drug innovation and how we then price the innovations. Uh, so uh, um, value, uh, value based pricing doesn't actually include the value that has been co created by the public institutions. And if we did, there would be very different ways to think about, for example, the prices of the drugs that are coming out. So we don't need the taxpayer to pay two or three different times. First, for the innovation itself, where the high risk capital intensive phase is often publicly financed. And then again, to subsidize the very high prices, uh, which are set by the pharmaceutical industry, by the state, bringing those prices down through subsidies uh, to the healthcare system. There's more efficient and more just ways to think about the pricing if we actually value uh, the different um, uh, investments that are made by different actors, not just in the private sector. Uh, second, innovation. This is obviously related to what I've just said. If we care about the end result and not just the innovation, there's all sorts of questions uh, that come about, for example, related to intellectual property rights. So I mentioned the vaccine. We have about eight different vaccines, but that's not the mission. The mission was and should be to vaccinate the entire world. And that would have ramifications for how we actually structure intellectual property rights and develop patent pools and, and share the knowledge. So these kinds of issues really need to be thought about ex ante, not ex post. I would call it a pre-distributive way to think about how to collaborate between public and private actors in the innovation space. Uh, patents in general tend to be too wide, just used for strategic reasons, too strong, hard to license, and often too upstream. So the tools for research are being privatized and patented. And so this isn't about pro or, or, or against patents, but how do we actually structure and govern an innovation system for the common good precisely in areas that actually include so much public funding? Um, and, and again, it's quite interesting here, if we look at the different vaccines, the AstraZeneca one, uh, I think 
you know, really represented a very different type of deal between public and private. So the Oxford University researchers insisted that the costs and the prices remain low and the knowledge be shared. Very different from one that happened uh, later in the case of uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, so we should go beyond just thinking about public and private and actually get our hands dirty with the granular of how do we learn from those types of collaborations that are more just and have access at the center and represent a more symbiotic deal between public and private and those that we should really be scaling down and learning from the problems uh, um, that are embedded in the design of those collaborations. Third, finance. You know, we, we sometimes forget that money is not just the medium of exchange, but how we structure finance matters. It's not neutral. So uh, if you look at, for example, the biotechnology sector, the fact that there was so much exit driven venture capital, which wanted to exit through an initial public offering or a buyout actually rushed the science and biotech. And myself and others have written about this. Bill Lazonic calls it Clepos. It's produced many productless IPOs by rushing the scientific um, uh, uh, well, the, the scientific research in order to uh, develop um, areas that could be then quickly bought up. That doesn't help the, the science, which can often take a very long time, but also the Death Valley phase for companies can often take longer than, say, three to seven years. So the requirement of actually needing patient long term finance, not just quick exit driven finance. This is one insight. But also, if we look at global financial organizations, and funds coming out of, say, the IMF and the World Bank, most recently with the um, Financial Intermediary Fund, which is meant to be helping us for pandemic preparedness. What really matters is to learn the lessons from the past in terms of actually embodying within these uh, uh, funds the right conditions. Um, so as we know, IMF loans and World Bank loans to uh, the developing world have often been conditional on reducing the fiscal space by you know, just focusing on deficits, how can we actually make sure that these funds are increasing the global fiscal space for developing countries to invest in their own uh, requirements in terms of on the ground preparedness, um, but also how can we make sure that the funds themselves are governed in a transparent way and in an inclusive way um, and a, basically a universal way so that we can actually make sure that the benefits are truly um, as widespread as possible. And fourth, our work on capacity. And this is again related to something I've just said, which is that one of the effects of a lot of the austerity that many countries have experienced has been this outsourcing of public sector capacity. We see this in different fronts, but in terms of uh, this uh, um, uh, points I'm making right now, it's in terms of the healthcare system. So it's, it's not enough to think that we can just kind of have helicopter money on the back of a COVID pandemic for a recovery scheme, we really need to better analyze how it could be that we have undermined and under-resourced those very systems also from a capacity point of view. So what does it mean to uh, invest in the ability to use, for example, outcomes-oriented procurement policy, which during COVID came back. It's, 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 it's something that we use during oriented procurement. Procurement is the interface between public and private actors and by being very clear on what the goal is, then that can help affect the whole supply chain. It can help affect that uh, public-private collaboration that I've been talking about throughout these four different points. Uh, but that's about having a creative bureaucracy, a creative civil service, and not outsourcing that capacity, whether it's to Deloitte, as we did in the UK, where the test and trace system was carried out by a consulting company that had very little experience on that front, but really investing within our local uh, 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 administrations that will be able to govern uh, the systems uh, that we need, of, of course, alongside different actors, whether it's in the philanthropy space, whether it's in the private space, but we need to admit what we've seen, which is the uh, lack of investment over the last decades in uh, public administrations, which then make our system so much weaker. Anyway, so thank you so much. These four areas about value, innovation, finance, and capacity are absolutely central if we want to deliver on clear moonshots around health for all. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. So now we can proceed to discussion.
part of this webinar. Um, and everybody who's an attendee, we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A and we'll moderate them um, and ask them in the discussion. Uh, so thank you very much. And Jeff, if you would like to lead the discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, I'd, I'd ask uh, anyone that is uh, on our panel first, uh, Mike and Juan Pablo, uh, to make any uh, uh, comments uh, at this point. And uh, we'll also look for questions coming in, and I see some are coming in, but uh, please uh, uh, jump in at, at this moment um, if you'd like. And yeah, please, Juan Pablo. Oh, very, very, very briefly, Jeff. No, I wanted to highlight um, Professor Masukato's message about investment in health. Um, for, for a long time, uh, and, and still, in many discussions, it's seen as a, as a recurrent cost, by the way. Um, so I, I do believe that that's a, a very important element. And um, she brought many other interesting comments that I'm sure you're going to be uh, reflecting upon. I also wanted to briefly say that uh, there's already a baseline of country coordinator mechanisms out there. Um, I'm the director of the Global Financing Facility, GFF, that works for women, children, and adolescents health. And it works through coordinating mechanisms at the country level. Um, in a recent study, um, um, I, I think that roughly 40% of countries had um, coordinated mechanisms. Now, the question is, is to have really one and a solid one. Sometimes uh, these methodologies are in a way copy paste and we can even have several coordinated mechanisms existing at the same time. So again, back to Mike Ryan's uh, um, uh, recommendation of integration at the country level, fundamental. And again, the, the country coordinating mechanisms can be the, the right approach. Um, and just to conclude, uh, on, on the pandemic fund, something that Joy brought in as a very important need, which is a multi-sectoral approach to pandemics, uh, is also being closely followed and fought. The, the One Health dimension is critical here. We talk a lot about it. But when we go to practical operational developments at the country level, we have less cases, but still there are important examples of successful One Health projects. And I think we will need to build on those for future pandemic preparedness. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one, uh, one way to overcome the uh, fragmentation and splintering <clears throat> is if WHO together with the financing institutions would create a, a basic template. This is what uh, a, uh, th this is what a, uh, an integrated framework should look like. You prepare it once uh, under WHO auspices together with the finance partners um, and the individual bilateral donors in a way are just pushed into uh, using that shared framework. I think it needs to come from the top, uh, the top being WHO and the financing partners or the financing institutions. But it won't emerge from the bottom up of saying, well, that's a nice plan. This one's not a nice plan or country X has, uh, has done this 50 times for different agencies, but rather have a template and again, maybe you can use 2023 as leverage for this. Uh, if you aim, you know, at the time of this summit for all of the deliverables that we've been talking about, uh, I, I think that um, you could clear a lot of the underbrush away and, and uh, really facilitate uh, facilitate a common approach. Mm -hmm. To my mind, it's crucial that WHO lead uh, and create a framework that has the buy-in of the world's health ministers and our central normative institution, and that it be done in conjunction with whatever general financing framework we have. And if it's a global fund, or as I say, uh, as a footnote to that, a uh, a virtual global fund that has a coordination mechanism among a number of funders, but it's one template, not 50 templates uh, that are agreed, 
by these institutions, that would be really a very big help. Uh, the ministries of health are so overtaxed to begin with that they can't do this 50 times. They need to do it once uh, in this exercise. And I do think that the, uh, you know, that, that the international system could basically put that, uh, put that to work uh, as uh, here's what we're gonna do. And uh, the UN as one backs that up uh, and uh, the, the MDBs back that up and, uh, you you make something that is actually much more functional as a result of that rather than going with getting 50 countries each one to make a sector-wide approach you just make it <laughs> and uh, here's the handbook here's the guidelines maybe it is the gff mechanism basically but now adding in all of these other components but I think all of us uh, basically feel that um, we need that kind of more efficient framework uh, and uh, linked to the actual financing. Julie, I see lots of questions. Um, excellent. I have sent some to you. Would you like me to ask them out loud? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question from uh, Labode Popula who says, uh, from Jeff's presentation and available facts, the worst hit countries in health coverage are the poorest countries. Mike emphasizes this by his reference to the need for an efficient health system. How do we reconcile these realities with migration of health workers from poor countries to countries with better health systems? Should there not be some deliberate action to stem the trend? Good question. I'll ask Mike or or uh, Juan Pablo for any reflections on that. No, the, 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 the reality is there is no work without a workforce, and and the brain drain from many developing countries who, to some extent, have become um, uh, feeders of health capacity into the north uh, through people using medical education, nursing education, health education in general as a means to move their families uh, forward choose to, uh, or don't, they don't often choose who wants to leave your home, but they're in many ways forced to choose to leave because the prospects of higher wages, more security um, is higher elsewhere. And again, this comes back, I think Jeffrey, it's not just the amount of money that's paid to a health worker in the setting of a developing country setting. It's, it's, it's also the continuity of those funds. I've been in many situations in epidemic response and humanitarian response in fragile states, particularly where health workers before the epidemic started hadn't been paid for months, sometimes years. Of course. Uh, so it's not just the amount of remuneration. It is about security. It's about continuity. It's about, it's about career prospects. It's about promotion on the basis of merit, not on the basis of who you know. There are so many drivers that push workers, health workers out of a country. It is not just wage related. Uh, there's so much more. And I think we have to look at that as a workforce and what are the incentives to stay uh, and the disincentives to stay versus the incentives to leave. Um, and migration is going to mean workers going abroad, coming from my own country, a small country on the edge of Europe. Historically, we gain most of our high level medical expertise by good doctors and nurses going abroad, getting experience and bringing that back home. That's not a negative thing. Uh, migration and health workers can be a very, very positive experience for everyone. The question is, is it managed? Is it functional? Does it result in a whole, uh, unfillable hole in the system providing workers? What are the incentives to bring people back to, to apply the learning they've had in another system? Uh, so it's a real, we need a systems way of thinking about this. Because again, it's not just an issue of regulating this to saying you can't go or punishing states or others who take workers in from other. It becomes zero sum game. Uh, we need a much more sophisticated mechanism to incentivize people to stay in their home systems. And the only way we can do that is to give people a living wage that they can rely on in which they have a career path 
Um, and if workers do go to the north from these countries, there must be a mechanism to compensate those countries who train and invest in those workers. I, I agree. I'm going to be a broken record uh, just to say that uh, if you have a, a country that is at $1,000 per capita and it's competing with countries at forty dollars or $50,000 per capita, and we yet have a standard that there should be health for all, uh, we need a financing mechanism to make that work. And for as long as I've been in this uh, business, which is 40 years, uh, somehow it's expected that uh, poor countries at tiny salaries and tiny budgets make that work, which doesn't happen. And we should do the arithmetic. You have to pay, as you said, a decent salary that is, uh, it doesn't have to be the same as uh, in a high income country because people would like to stay in their home country, but not at a ratio that's 100 to 1 and unreliable and inconsistent. But I guarantee you, this is what is going to continue in low income countries until recurrent costs are paid internationally in some way and that's what we need to help explain again and again uh maybe they know i don't know whether they know or not but uh there needs to be a decent salary it's the same by the way in the education sector it's uh, but health is especially uh, uh dramatic in this regard because not only do people migrate, but the rich countries come in shopping for nurses and doctors uh, very aggressively. Um, and so this is uh, also part of a game which is absolutely uh, not tolerable the way that it's played right now. Juan Pablo, I see you had your hand up. Well, very quickly, I, I wanted to, to underscore that this has been a chronic problem, only that uh, COVID made it uh, more acute because of the burnout. But we have, for many years, we have been missing the proper response to stop this brain drain, which makes things even more difficult and the weakest systems. Um, I also would just add that there may be also a um, harmonization of regulatory frameworks around this that should also be carefully looked, especially for regional initiatives that could help, in a way, uh, reduce the, the burden of this migration. But again, it's an unanswered problem, and it's a really, really current one. Traveling through countries, it's incredible how this is hurting systems as they try to get back in their feet. Thanks. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Joy. Yeah, I think I think the other issue related to um, health workers is really. Um, the availability of, um, you know, the, the, the conditions of service, but not not the finance. I mean, absolutely, I agree with all the comments that are made. But you find that health workers get into a facility. There are no medicines for treating. They don't have, um, a, you know, they don't have anything to test uh, people. They, they they don't have any laboratory support network. The support services are not there. They cannot access patients. Even if they access them, they're not able to help them. So that 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 can be really uh, cause a lot of um, you know pressure on 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 the on the health workers. So some health workers migrate not just because they are underpaid, but they actually cannot save lives. That it's a decision where they cannot save lives. So I think all of these things are interconnected. We cannot just address you know the health worker issue without addressing access to commodities, the strengthening of the other, you know, essential components of a robust health system. So I think, you know, we, we need to identify so what are the global common goods for preparedness that needs to be in place? And what is the best way of financing them that you say? We cannot isolate one because everything is interconnected. So it doesn't matter what it is, whether it is the intellectual property issues that someone referred to earlier on, but everything is interconnected. And, and uh, we have a narrow set, like you have said, powerful actors, 
that have proposed solutions for these global problems, but they are not working, not for us in lower and mid, lower middle income countries. So we need to create a, 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 a system that is more responsive based on global uh, public goods, uh, which are common goods, which are for preparedness, properly financed, and that can that can be easily accessible to all these countries, including the financing of, of of health workers. But it cannot be limited to that. So that's that's the comment I wanted to make. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very very clear. And maybe we'll take one more question, Julie. Excellent. Um, so we have a question from Ritu Sadana, who's leading the WHO Secretariat supporting the Council on the Economics of Health for All that's chaired by Professor Mazzucato, um, who just spoke. And she asks, uh, austerity measures often require cutting of health and education programs. And she says this needs to be turned around. How can we turn around this practice, given the different voices and aims of the global, global financing institution? Maybe I'll take a starting crack at that. Um, I've been asked by uh, Secretary General Guterres and Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed to uh, help think through uh, a, a better approach to SDG financing in general. And in September, uh, Secretary General Guterres uh, called for an SDG stimulus as a general framework for increasing the fiscal space for the sustainable development goals. And we have our eye on, as I've been emphasizing, the multilateral development banks as the primary instrument for this expanded development finance. Uh, of course, private finance will play a role. Direct investment will play a role. Domestic saving will play a role. But the development finance institutions the World Bank, the regional development banks, uh, some other uh, important national development banks that also have a global uh, finance role are crucial. And the key is to mobilize those institutions so that uh, poor countries don't have to uh, move to austerity when capital market conditions tighten as they are right now. If we go in this immediate crisis in the normal way, we will have dozens of developing countries facing budget crises in the next year because they're being hit hard by rising interest rates, by the uh, sharp increase of energy and food and fertilizer prices, by the existing debts that they carry, by the tightening of financial conditions, and so on. But if you look at their uh, situation more generally from a development point of view, these are countries that need a lot more finance and investment, and not only in health, but in other areas as well. And we need, therefore, that uh, when these countries have their interface with uh, the development finance institutions, the outcome is more financing, not less financing. And that requires that the development finance institutions have the wherewithal to provide that, which they don't quite have right now. But as I've emphasized, these institutions, starting with the World Bank and the regional development banks, need to expand their portfolios and can do so many times if they are backed by the world's governments which uh, profess to have a commitment to all of this our our treasury secretary in the united states janet yellen gave an important speech in the spring where she said we have to move from billions to trillions in development finance getting that through the u.s congress and so forth is uh, not the easiest uh, call in the world but this is actually what we're talking about and the health finance is a piece of a more general puzzle. We need to expand development finance now, and yet we're in a kind of cyclical moment with tightening credit markets where normally there would be more budget cutting rather than fiscal space. And so this is why this coming year, 
is actually so important. I've been asked specifically work with a number of governments in the real time negotiations with the fund and the bank and others to make sure that we go in the expansionary, not contractionary direction. To my mind, that makes sense because good development finance looks at this from a 40 year perspective, not a one year budget cycle perspective. And in a 40 year perspective, these countries should take on more debt, actually, as long as it's good long term IBRD or IDA terms that give them a long term scenario for turning the increased debt finance into increased investments, increased growth, better health, better education, all of the objectives that we have. So I think that the question is right to the point right now because we're in that tightening cycle, uh, which is quite dangerous, something like it was 40 years ago in our previous stagflation, but we need not to follow the same route that we did 40 years ago, which was a generalized debt crisis actually of developing countries. We need an expansionary stimulus for SDG accomplishment, including the health systems building that we're talking about on, on this webinar right now, and on which I think there's radical agreement among the panelists on uh, what really needs to be done. And the point I would add as a macroeconomist is the poor countries have tremendous capacity to achieve economic development if they are financed to do so. And so what looks like a lot of debt right now is actually quite manageable if you take a 30 or 40 year perspective, because that would be a growth perspective. And a big amount of debt now is not a big amount of debt in a context of rapid economic growth. And that's what we have to help everybody to see. It's worth making the investment. And it actually reminds me of one point I wanted to follow up with Juan Pablo. Our national accounts data really are not helpful because we count health spending and education spending as consumption rather than as saving and investment. It's analytically wrong. If it were done the other way, we'd have much more clarity that when we fund finance these areas, even in our national accounts, we're boosting investment and boosting growth. And that's not just a nice thing to say because it sounds good. It's actually literally how you achieve economic development. And so if we reclassified our national accounts as we should to put health and education spending into the investment category, we'd have a much greater clarity of why more financing is feasible, not only desirable, but actually sustainable from a long-term budgetary point of view. So I, this is how I'd like to change the national accounts. It was just a, a mistake in our SNA handbooks written 60 years ago to put education as a, as a, not only as a cost, but as a consumption item rather than an investment item. And same with, same with health. So I'm going to let uh, Juan Pablo and uh, Mike have the last words, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah, thanks so much. And listening to you, I was thinking that it would have been great having you by my side when I was confronting my colleague, the Minister of Finance, looking at those accounts, but it's a little bit too late, as always happens with experience. But I wanted to quickly react also on, on what um, this upcoming discussion will mean for, for the World Bank. Um, of course, as you said, um, a big pressure to step up the, the capital and lending uh, capacity of, of the bank and other multilaterals. I think that's gonna be a, a great discussion and hopefully a positive one in terms of results. The second dimension has to do with the operational models in which the banks work. And here, again, I want to insist in the importance of moving from national interventions to also regional and global interventions. Yes. Why? Because we're talking about global public goods. And the two best examples, of course, are climate change, as we saw in these past weeks, and uh, pandemics like we've been feeling during the last three years. And, and lastly, and it's meaningful because it touches something that um, Mariana said, and it has to do with the purpose. This also has to be reflected and embedded 
in the mission and vision of our institutions. We need to think that our purpose has a global public good in it. It is extremely important. We're not 50 years ago looking at countries and frontiers. I think we're a much bigger community that interacts permanently and therefore collective endeavors and trust among all of us globally is going to be fundamental. So I just wanted to end highlighting those three direct implications for um, my institution and also for many other institutions. And it's think globally and let's act collectively. Perfect, perfect, wonderful. And uh, we'll do it. And uh, Mike, over to you for the final words. No, I, I just wanted to draw together two things that you've all been saying, and Joy was also saying as well. Uh, the reality is that 74 countries have completed national action plans for public health security, which are country owned multi year plans based on a one health and all hazards whole of government approach. They exist. Our problem is none of them are funded. The problem is the countries know what they want to do, and they've done that analysis. And if you look at that map, uh, that you, the three maps you showed, Jeff, where we saw the gaps in equity and the gaps in financing and the gaps in health workers and all of that, if you look at that map, the countries who have done those, those national action plans are in those countries. It is exactly in the gap countries that these national action plans have been done. We need one plan, many donors, many supporters, many uh, champions, not many plans, uh, and I think we have got to get back to that idea of a nationally owned sovereign plan. Now, governments need to engage non-governmental organizations and civil society. It can't be seen purely as an inside the government effort. So I think there's a huge benefit in thinking about how can we focus in on that. The IHR calls for that. It's, it's legislating international law. I hope the future treaty enshrines that principle. Uh, I think organizations like ourselves and the World Bank are beginning, I think, to show the kind of discipline and commitment to doing things together to support countries rather than, you know, in effect, acting as tidal agents uh, in country. Because it, the tidal force, the tectonic forces that a Ministry of Health or Ministry of Finance feel are huge. And sometimes we add to that. We actually create instability in, in that process. Last thing I would say is, and I'd say this in a message of hope, I actually think with climate, with health and others, I think the world is waking up. Our young people are waking up to a world that they want to see that's fairer, that's more just, that's more equitable. Um, I think we have never in the history of our civilization ever been in a better position to protect and restore health. It's not that we have to develop the technologies to do it, we have them. So the issue for me is to, to, to keep that hope and that perseverance and that dogged desire to deliver. And when the obstacles are governmental and legislative, let's take them out of the way. When the, when the obstacles are financial, let's remove that and let's unlock the potential of our health systems. Let's unlock the potential of our societies. Uh, the mechanics of how we do that are in our grasp. If we can put egos and organizational and other sort of ideologies aside for a few moments, we actually have a massive opportunity. So at a moment of, un, of historic risk, we actually have an unprecedented opportunity. And I, I don't see that coming again for a very long time. I don't think if we don't take this chance now, if we don't take this opportunity now, I've been at this for 30 years. I've seen it come and go. And you've been around maybe a year or two longer, Jeffrey. But <laughs> <laughs> I've been through the Ebola's of the 90s. I've been through the massive meningitis outbreaks in Africa. I've been through the cholera spread in East and Southern Africa. I've been through the yellow fever epidemics. I've been through the, the SARS. I've been through H5N1. I've been through H1N1 in 2009, the West Africa Ebola. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's high time we learned those lessons and did something about the essential underlying issues. And just final word, most people who died in the pandemic didn't actually die from the virus. They died because of 20, 30, 40 years of unmanaged underlying conditions, unmanaged hypertension, unmanaged diabetes. So many of our population were so vulnerable before this pandemic hit. And then we couldn't deliver the, we couldn't deliver the, the rescue. We put people in a leaky boat and then we were late to the rescue. And that, I think we have to look at both sides of that uh, in the future. So over to you. 
Wonderful uh, final words, closing words. Thanks to everybody for a fantastic session. We will post this. Uh, we'll have uh, the summaries uh, of the presentations as well. Um, and uh, we have uh, a tremendous opportunity in the coming months. And uh, I, I think uh, a, a clear path ahead of working together to realize uh, all that uh, we have been discussing together. So thanks to everybody for your leadership and for your participation today. Uh, thanks to all who have joined the webinar. And uh, we will be posting this uh, online at the uh, Lancet COVID-19 Commission website and SDSN website. And uh, to everybody, stay well, stay healthy, uh, and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>